Well, thank you very much, Robin, for the introduction, and it is an absolute honour to be here in the Royal Institution um, talking about gravitational waves. Again, before the start, we had a little look around at a little tour of the museum downstairs, and it is a fabulous, fabulous place um, to be, to give a talk on science of any subject, but for me tonight, gravitational waves. And as the title says, I'm going to talk about catching gravitational waves, how that's a new discovery, and what's coming in terms of a new astronomy. Um, so we're going to talk about gravitational waves, and so clearly we're going to talk about gravitation. So I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction about why gravity is such an unusual, um, has an unusual place in our understanding of the universe. Because pretty much, all the interactions that we understand, that we can, we can observe in the universe, almost all are covered by four forces, four fundamental forces, and they're up on this slide there. And two of those you're probably familiar with because we experience them in everyday life. There's gravity, gravitation. Again, and you have a pretty good feel for what gravity um, is and, and what gravity feels like because it's what holds us here on the Earth. We know if we pick up an object and let it go, it will fall, and it's gravity that's responsible for that. There are three other fundamental forces, the weak, the electromagnetic, and the strong. Now, the electromagnetic force is another one, again, that we experience in everyday life. Every time you have a magnet, again, if you have a fridge magnet and you feel the pull as you hold that magnet up to a piece of metal to the front of the fridge where it sticks, that's the electromagnetic force. The other two forces, the weak and the strong force, they're really significant only over very short distances, and they're very important, but really at atomic scales inside atoms. Of those four, gravity is by far the weakest. And it doesn't always feel like that to us, again, because we're sensitive to it every day. Um, but gravity is by far the weakest. And up the right-hand slight side there, there's the relative strength of those forces. And to give you an idea of what those numbers mean, if you imagine the force of gravity has a strength of one, and you kind of know what that feels like, because if you jump up, come back down, you feel that's gravity. So say that's that pull that you feel has a strength of one. The next strongest force, the weak force, is 10 to the power 25 times stronger than gravity. What does that mean? Well, if it was 10 times stronger, you'd have a, that would be 10, just 10, you'd know what that meant. If it was 100 times stronger, that would be 10 to the power 2, 1,000 would be 10 to the 3, 10,000, 10 to the 4, so 10 to the 25, you can imagine, is enormously stronger, hugely stronger. So gravity is very weak, but it's very important, and as it says there, it's the force responsible for our very existence. And why is that? Well, in the electromagnetic force, that magnet, remember, magnets have a plus and a minus, there's a, there's a plus and a minus charge. And so on large scales, the effects of plus and minus charge tend on the whole to cancel out and things are kind of neutral. Gravity only has one sign, it's always attractive. And so all objects are attracted to one another under gravity and on large scales that effect just adds up. So on the scale of the universe, it's gravity that actually dominates. It's responsible both for the birth of stars and the death of stars, and the fact that we exist. The fact we have stars out there at all, well, there are clouds of dust and gas, and all the individual um, parts, the, the matter, the, the molecules that make up those start to be attracted to one another, they pull together, until eventually, um, at the center of those dense clouds, um, they fuse together and, and the stars start to shine. So gravity on a universal scale is very important. And Newton described the force of gravity and how objects were attracted to one another in his law of gravitation. And it's quite simple. He doesn't explain what gravity is, but he describes how it works, how things behave under gravity. So if you have two objects, those two objects feel a pull, an attraction to one another, 
And the size of that pool depends on the size, the mass, rather, of each of the objects and how far apart they are. And that has an interesting consequence that's a bit disturbing when you think about it because it de that pool depends on the separation of those two objects. So if one of those objects is us here on Earth and the other object is a star far away in the universe, there's a gravitational pull that depends how far apart we are. And if that star moves, in other words, the distance between the star and the Earth changes, the gravitational pull changes, we would feel a different pull here. And in Newton's theory, we would know then instantaneously that that star had moved because we'd feel a different pull, a different, a different uh, gravitational pull here on Earth. And that's an uncomfortable thought that we could know instantly about what was something, about something that was happening some distance away. That's what's called instantaneous action at a distance. And it bothered even Newton. I think if you go back, you can find some, some of his writings where he realized this was an uncomfortable part of his theory of gravity. And it really took Einstein to come along with his special theory of relativity. And what special relativity says is that no information can be transmitted faster than the speed of light. No information. And that includes gravitational information. We can't know instantly about a, a change in gravitational pull that, that's caused by some object far away. So actually, Special relativity tells us there must be traveling gravitational signals traveling across the universe. But it took general relativity, um, a more complete theory from Einstein, to actually um, uh, explain in more detail what those traveling gravitational signals were. Now, Robin mentioned Glasgow, and actually you'll recognize in this picture Einstein. Again, this is a picture of Einstein in Glasgow. He was there, he got an honorary degree um, from Glasgow in 1933, so he was there to collect his honorary degree. And uh, while he was there, he also gave talks and he gave a lecture. He gave a lecture on general relativity. And actually, the picture on the right there is the cover of <coughs> the write-up of those lectures from the, the university press at that time, university publishers. And that's long enough uh, ago now that there's pretty much no one around who remembers you know, the lectures, who remembers being there, but it's not all that long ago. There were people alive who could just about remember back to that time. And by all accounts, it was pretty incomprehensible. <laughs> and people had real trouble understanding what he was saying, because general relativity and the maths, of course, is not easy. Um, but it's an interesting picture of that one, because I think you'd all agree Einstein's pretty recognizable there. He's that instantly recognizable uh, chap in full iconic mode with the, the, the flowing hair. Um, but all the other folks in that picture are also you know, um, very, very worthy people. One of them was the principal of the university at the time. I think one of them was the Archbishop of, of Ireland. But today, when we look at that picture, it's Einstein who stands out. It's the scientist who's instantly recognizable. And I think, I think that's very, very interesting. So what did general relativity, um, again, uh, we could do go through all the maths, but it, it possibly wouldn't be very enlightening. So it's easier to think in terms of the, the picture of what general relativity tells us, the physical picture. And what it tells us is that we can think about gravity in a different way, in a geometrical way. So there we have, again, a picture on the right there. And if you imagine this is our universe, and, and imagine, first of all, our universe is empty. There's a kind of flat, empty universe with nothing in it. Then we come along and we add uh, a star, say, to our universe. And you can see what it's done is it's curved the fabric of the universe. There's a curve. And so you can imagine if we came along and we added a second object to our universe, plonked it on our sheet, it would try and roll down that sheet towards the first object. It would be as if they were attracted together. And that curvature caused by the presence of mass, we can think of as gravity. General relativity tells us that gravity we can think of as a curvature in space caused by the presence of mass. You can imagine now if that star moves, if it, if it wobbles, if it does something really violent like explodes, that curvature will change. And in fact, if it, this is a, a rubber universe here, ripples will be set up on the surface if that mass suddenly changes its position. 
Those ripples, those ripples in the curvature of space are the, the gravitational signals. Remember that curvature is telling us about gravity. They'll travel out across the universe. And those are the gravitational waves that we're interested in detecting. Now, what sorts of things in the universe could cause gravitational waves like that? Well, we said gravity was responsible for the birth of stars. It's also responsible for the death of stars. And so if we take a star like our sun, um, in the middle, again, we have hydrogen fusing into helium, giving out energy. And that's causing pressure uh, with, the, with, the, with the atoms and molecules in there. At the same time, gravity is trying to cause that star to collapse. And there's a balance as those two things uh, balance one another. But eventually, of course, we'll run out of fuel, and gravity again in the end wins. And a supernova, the, the center of the star collapses, blows off the outside, um, and we're left again, perhaps with that collapsed core in the middle there, <coughs> and pushing together the electrons and protons and the very atoms to make neutrons, to make a neutron star. Now, when that happens, there's a huge amount of mass, that matter in the star, that suddenly moves. And that, again, is something we believe could produce gravitational waves. And again, if the star is massive enough, it doesn't stop at being a neutron star, gravity takes it further, and uh, that whole thing collapses into what we call a black hole, where a black hole, of course, is called black because it's a region of space in which Gravity is so strong that not even light can escape the gravitational pull. Those neutron stars, again, we believe, again, uh, that are formed in such things, can spin. There's, they can be spinning in the form of what we call pulsars. Those neutron stars, again, have residual magnetic fields. They catch um, charged particles along the, the fields. If you accelerate a charged particle as it moves along, it will radiate, and radio waves can be produced. And so as the star is spinning round with, with uh, cones of radio waves coming out of either end, they sweep round as the star spins. And again, if they sweep past us on the Earth like a beacon, we can detect those. And again, in the centre of this uh, beautiful nebula here called the Crab Nebula, Again, we believe there's such a thing, a spinning neutron star, what we call a pulsar. And again, I couldn't resist, of course, uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell is very famous, again, for being uh, associated with the discovery of the, the first pulsars. And again, she also graduated from Glasgow at one point, so again, <laughs> put her on the slide there. Um, those spinning neutron stars, if they're not perfectly spherical, if they have a lump, on the surface, as, it's, as they're spinning round. Imagine them spinning, making a dent in space, sending out ripples across space. Again, those could be sources of gravitational waves. Say we have two neutron stars that get caught in one another's gravity, and so they start to spiral round in what we call a binary system, a pair of stars. As they do that, they're causing dents in space, changing uh, uh, the curvature of space, losing energy, and, and losing that some of it in the form of gravitational waves spreading out across the universe, getting faster and faster as they get closer together until eventually they collide and give out a burst of gravitational radiation. We talked about neutron stars, but of course that could also be perhaps a pair of black holes. And <clears throat> perhaps... Uh, until recently, one of the most famous examples of this is what's called the binary pulsar, um, a system in which one of the, one of the stars there was a, was a pulsar. Again, and those chaps here are two scientists, Russell Hulse and uh, Joe Taylor, and they're looking very happy because they, of course, got the Nobel Prize for observations of this binary star system. Again, from looking at the radio emission, they were able to measure how the orbit of those stars was changing, and were able to show that the stars were getting closer and closer together exactly in the way that general relativity would predict if they were giving out energy in the form of, of gravitational waves. And again, the plot here is, is rather amazing. You can see there's time here, and up the side here is telling us, um, effectively it's telling us the decrease 
in the time for those stars to reach closest approach. And so you can see it fits the prediction beautifully. So that was evidence that, that the prediction of gravitational waves existing was real. Now, there are a, that's some sources. There are actually a whole set of sources out in the universe of things that could be producing gravitational waves. And this plot here, to try and explain what we're, we're seeing, you can see um, the period here along the top, which is telling us, again, uh, it's telling us the time it takes for one cycle of a gravitational wave. And so here, here's kind of seconds. Um, this is a bit faster than, 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 than seconds here. Sort of, uh, this, this is a wave um, that's, that's kind of waving, oscillating at about 100 hertz or even higher. And the sorts of sources we've talked about kind of fall into this range here, and the detectors, mostly that I'll talk about today, are aimed at those sources. But there's a whole range of different exciting sources that can produce gravitational waves. And we need different kinds of detectors to target those different sources. In the same way with astronomy, we don't just have optical telescopes. We have X-ray, UV, gamma ray, um, uh, uh, looking at the cosmic microwave background, hold different telescopes targeting different sources. The same is true for gravitational waves. So mostly, I'll talk about the kinds of sources um, we've talked about today. And one of those is indeed pairs of black holes. And so this is a little model to show you, again, here's two black holes orbiting round, again, caught in one another's gravity. And the little animation underneath is kind of an indication of what they're doing to the space round about them and to time round about them. And along the bottom here, you'll see a signal. And I'll just run this again for you. And that signal along the bottom is what we expect. So let's just go forward again is what we would expect if we're a long way away from, from those black holes, and it's just as well we are, a long way away from them, that signal along the bottom is what they're doing to the curvature of space a long way away. They're causing it to vibrate. And as they get closer and closer together, it vibrates faster and faster until they get so close that the, the, the horizons of the black holes merge and they actually coalesce into a single black hole, which then wobbles a little bit afterwards. And that, indeed, is just the kind of source that we detected earlier this year. With the two gravitational wave detectors of the, of the LIGO project, the LIGO and Virgo collaborations, two big collaborations that I'll talk about, with those detectors found just such a signal. And this is the actual data here from the two instruments of the collaboration. And you can see there this very characteristic shape of the, the space-time, sensing space-time, actually um, uh, being distorted from two black holes far out in the universe with a signal that's traveled across the universe to arrive at the detectors. Underneath, you can see our best model. Again, this, this is, of course, uh, the actual signals with, again, some noise in the instrument there, but it fits beautifully our models for a black hole system merging. And again, this is quite a, quite a remarkable thing for, for many reasons. Again, encoded in that signal are the properties of the two black holes. We can tell the masses of the black holes. We can tell information about the spins of the black holes. Again, about the mass of the final black hole that merged. And this, this event was actually detected in September last year, which turned out to be the, it's the 100th anniversary of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And it was announced, again, because it took some time, of course, to be 100% sure that this, this was a real signal and something we had really detected, announced this year which is the 100th anniversary of the prediction that gravitational waves should exist. So a fabulous, fabulous thing. And for many reasons, it actually involved many firsts, not just the first direct detection of gravitational waves, but actually the first time people had, had, had experimental evidence for two black holes, direct evidence for the two black holes actually spiraling in to merge. 
because there are various uh, predictions out there. Uh, some of these predictions about how black holes uh, behave in the universe were such that we might never have seen two black holes merging in the, in the age of the universe. And so, so this was a, a, a terrific discovery. We can tell from that signal, again encoded in that signal, is the distance out to the coalescence. We can tell how long ago it happened. Actually, the distance was 1.3 billion light years, where of course a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. So, so they've been traveling to us for a phenomenally long time, just in time for us to detect them. Those, those objects are things, and this event were things, that actually we think may not produce any no optical light, no electromagnetic signals, and we might not be able to detect in any other way than from the gravitational signals. It's an entirely different way of doing astronomy. We can tell, again, from that chirp, that evolving signal, that the, the final black hole uh, had a mass that was about 62 times the mass of the Sun, about 20 million Earth masses. We can tell the size of the black hole, what we call the event horizon. It was about 366 kilometers across, which is about the size of Iceland. That the black hole was spinning about 100 times a second, and that at the edges, of that, that uh, diameter, the, the edge of the diameter, a point on that was spinning at almost half the speed of light. And all of that information is encoded in that gravitational signal. So again, just a quick recap. What are gravitational waves? Well, they, they are basically a strain in space, a tiny strain in space. And you can think of them as being as being ripples caused by an event spreading out through space as ripples spread across a pond. And we can, and we have now for the first time, used them to study objects that don't emit light or electromagnetic signals that can only be actually sensed this way. So how, how did we do that? Well, if we think about the effect of gravitational waves, what physical effect do they have? Well, we said they stretch and compress space. They cause space to distort. So if we look at a patch of space on the board here, if we pick this as our patch of space, and we draw a circle, you can see that gravitational waves coming from far out in the universe that have been traveling across the universe to us, landing here on Earth, going through the board, actually would cause this, part, this circle to turn into an ellipse in one direction, back to a circle, an ellipse in the other direction, and back again. So the, physically, if we tried to measure the distance between two points on the board, it would change. But it wouldn't change very much. These are extremely challenging experiments to do. For two points on the board like that, that were about a meter apart, a typical passing gravitational wave would only change their separation by about 10 to the minus 22 of a meter. So to give some perspective on, on again, what, what does that number mean, the width of a human hair can vary, but it's about 50 microns, much smaller than a millimeter. That's 50 times 10 to the minus 6 meters is the, the width of a human hair. The size of a typical atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 to the minus 22 meters is, is, is tiny compared to these distances. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenal challenge experimentally to, to measure this effect. So you need a very good um, way to measure that, a very good ruler. And for that, effectively what we do is we use the wavelength of light as our measuring instrument. And we use something called a Michelson interferometer. We take light from a laser. We shine that onto what's effectively a half-silvered plate, a beam splitter. It splits that light beam in two, sends it out to hit mirrors, which reflect the light back to the beam splitter, where it adds up again, and then we sit and look at the beam splitter to see what's going on. Now, how does that help us? Well, if you think about what gravitational waves are doing to space, if we take our mirrors here and here, and we imagine that's one mirror there and one mirror there. As one mirror goes out, the other mirror goes in, and the distance that light travels out each of these arms changes as a gravitational wave goes past. 
What does that mean? Well, you know that we can think of light as a wave. We have light waves traveling out each of these arms. If the, the arms were the same distance, so that light, when the wave went up this arm and the wave went this, this arm and was reflected back, if it arrives back here so that the two waves, you can think of even uh, uh, two waves arriving back if they both add up together when they come back, they add up to make a larger wave and we would see a bright spot in, in light if we actually looked at this point. If, on the other hand, something has passed by, changed the distance that light travels in each arm, so one light wave travels further than the other, they can arrive back at the beam splitter with one wave in a peak, the other one in a trough, and cancel out. And we would see a dark spot. So by looking actually at how, the, how bright the spot is at that beam splitter, we can tell if the mirrors are moving because the intensity, the brightness of the light changes. And that is what we do in sensing gravitational waves. And so it means that we're easily sensitive to things of the order of the wavelength of light. And that's relatively easy to do. These experiments are more challenging. So this is kind of a simplified version um, where we use a lot of technology, a lot of uh, optical tricks to be even more sensitive than that. But this is, this is the principle and it's a pretty good start. And the, the, there are a lot of things, of course, that can try and move those mirrors more than a gravitational wave will. Now, I won't talk about all of these, but if we look again towards the bottom of the slide there, some obvious ones are seismic noise. If we just took our detectors and put the mirrors on the surface of the Earth, the Earth shakes, and it would shake those mirrors much more than a gravitational wave would. That's actually relatively easy to get around. What we do is we take those mirrors and we hang them as pendulums. And um, for if, if the top of our pendulum is connected to the Earth, as long as the Earth is shaking, not at the resonant frequency of the pendulum, and you know if you just take a pendulum and move your hand, you can make the pendulum swing, but you'll discover if you move your hand quite quickly, you can try this, the pendulum won't move very much at all, and you've basically built a mechanical filter to filter out seismic noise. Gravity gradient noise, that's another problem. Well, we talked about Newton earlier and Newton's law of gravity. And remember, it just said if you've got two objects and their distance changes, there's a gravity change in gravitational pull. So if we've taken our mirror, happily suspended it so it's hanging there free, that's one mass, if a person comes and walks past some distance away, that person is another mass whose distance to the first mass is changing, and that will exert a pull on the mirror. And that is something we can't shield against. There's no way to shield against gravity. So that's quite a fundamental noise source in, in our instruments, but it, it's a low frequency noise source. People move slowly, cars move slowly, People don't run 100 times a second back and forward past our mirrors. So <clears throat> at low frequencies, that's a problem. And it's one of the reasons why some of those exciting sources I talked about, remember we had that whole <coughs> excuse me, spectrum of, of, of uh, uh, sources and different frequencies of waves that we wanted to detect, some of those we cannot do on Earth because of gravity gradient noise. We have to put detectors in space. Last uh, but not least on the slide here is thermal noise. Um, every atom in our mirror <clears throat> is just at room temperature, so it's vibrating with thermal energy. And again, <clears throat> that is one again, that we have to design around, but it's an important noise source. All of these noise sources actually, um, we, can, we can reduce their effects if we make our detectors large. And so the Michelson type interferometer I showed you those aren't things that are on a bench top. These are large installations. And so the two observatories that made the, the detection earlier this year um, are large. They actually have four kilometer long arms in the Michelsons. And this is where they're located. You can see one is in Hanford in uh, Washington State in the US, and the other one is in Livingston uh, near Louisiana, in Louisiana. No, it's about an hour from New Orleans in the US. Um, and they're operated by uh, Caltech and MIT, and um, they manage them. 
um, but they're used by a whole collaboration of scientists, again, that I'll talk about. And actually, here in the UK, we're partners in this project because some of the technology, actually critical technology to suspend the mirrors, was supplied by the UK um, as part of this project. And it really does require instrument science, hands-on experimental science, right at the forefront of physics. And again, this is a fabulous place to talk about that, having seen again in the museum here some of the, the terrific experimental work that's done, that, that was done historically associated with the institution. So these are phenomenal feats of technology. And it is a big collaboration. There are over a thousand scientists who, who um, work on these observatories and use the data, studying the data. They come from all around the globe, again, um, uh, and actually many, many different countries all working together. So to, to let you see a little bit more what these observatories look like, uh, this is a, a short video. This is the Hanford site in Washington State, first of all. And you'll see this is one of those long arms, again, going back towards the center building, which is where the laser uh, sits. And there's another arm out here. And you should be able to see, we'll fly down, we'll do a turn, and you'll see disappearing off four kilometers into the distance the arm. This is the other site in Louisiana. Again, and you can see that characteristic L shape of those giant Michelson interferometers. Um, they're both very interesting sites. The Hanford um, detector is on a Department of Energy nuclear site in the US. And again, when you visit, and you can go and you can visit these observatories, and they, they take tours. Um, when you visit the Hanford site, you'll see reactor domes every now and again on the landscape, which are mostly now used, I think, for making material for, for medical, nuclear material for medical purposes. And it's very dry. It's in a dry desert area, tumbleweed. Um, this is a very different site in, in Louisiana. You can see it's in a, in, in a swampy area in Louisiana. It means, actually, again, it's a beautiful site to visit. You can just see up the, one of the arms here, there's a pool of water. And that's because the detector itself is built up above the flood level there. And so to do that, there was earth dug out along these four kilometer arms, the construction project, banks were made, and the interferometer built up in these. But if you dig a hole in a swamp, it quickly fills with water. Shortly after that, it fills with wildlife. And so it's, a, it's actually beautiful. It's a lovely site to visit. So these are large installations. And science like this sometimes comes with additional challenges. Um, these are all pictures, I think, from the Hanford site. And it is a very dry area, a uh, desert area. And so there was a wildfire that you can see here. These are some of my colleagues standing on top of the center station, looking thoughtfully at the fire in the distance, um, approaching towards them. And you can see, actually, the fire burned right up to the arm of the instrument. These are concrete covers that cover the instrument, uh, that cover the arms. Um, there are inside those, there are metal pipes, which have had all the air evacuated from them. The laser beams are fired down those. Um, and these acted as, this here you can see acted as a fire break for the, for the wildfire there. You can see it is on a Department of Energy Nuclear Reserve. This is a security guard who one night forgot there was a four kilometer long scientific installation there, um, got into his car, shot off across the site. I believe he was fine, the detector was fine, his car possibly not so fine. Um, but these are all additional challenges when you're trying to detect black holes far out in the universe that you possibly don't think in advance you're going to have to uh, face up to in doing that. So there isn't these, this was the two, I've talked about the two LIGO detectors that made this first detection. But for various reasons, as I'll, as, as I'll talk about, scientifically it's important to have a network of these detectors around the globe. And there's a network of these, again, that's, that's uh, partly operational, the two LIGO instruments, but there are other detectors that are in, in various stages of construction. Um, in the UK, we operate with our German partners a smaller instrument, not quite as sensitive as the bigger ones, called uh, GEO in, in Germany, um, in which some of the technology, in fact, for the big LIGO detectors was first uh, developed and tested. In Italy, there's, there's a collaboration uh, of various European groups 
who are very close to starting to operate their instrument. In Japan, there's an instrument under construction. And in fact, in India, again, very recently, the government there gave in principle approval to site a third LIGO instrument there. So 2015, these, these started to operate. Virgo should come online this year, Kagra a bit later, and, and LIGO India a bit later than that. And these formed three separate collaborations of folks in GEO, we were part of the LIGO collaboration, all working together. And that working together is very important. One of the reasons for that, one of the key reasons, is trying to understand where in the universe these signals are coming from when they, they, they arrive with us. And the first key way we do that is by timing when the signals arrive at the different detectors. And we, it's, it's triangulation. We basically can tell if, if a signal arrived, uh, say, first here and then here, then it must have been closer to this detector. And the more detectors we have, the better we can tell where in the sky a signal came from. And in fact, I think the the first signal detected did arrive first in Livingston. I think they're very proud of that. 7.3 milliseconds later, it arrived in Hanford. Apparently, it was slightly clearer in Hanford, so they like to brag about that. Um, but it's important that we have multiple detectors. And that's we're detecting the gravitational signals and seeing things you can't see any other way, black holes. But there are other exciting sources that should produce optical, electromagnetic signals, and we want to work with our colleagues elsewhere in, in the astronomy field, because by combining our information, we can do more science. And in fact, we closely work with them. When we um, detect something that's coincident, we take that information, we get, try and get information about where in the universe it may have come from, we check that everything was operating properly, so quite a lot of this is automated, but a human being comes in and checks everything looks okay. Then we send that information out to our colleagues who have telescopes that they can swing round and point and try and see was there a counterpart to the gravitational signal. With just two instruments, however, we can't do so well in telling exactly where a signal came from, where a gravitational signal came from. In fact, it's a patch of a few hundred square degrees in the sky, and covering that with any telescope in, in depth is hard. Um, the more detectors we have, the better we can do. And in fact, this is a picture, again, of the, the sky, and for the event that we detected, it's called GW 1509-14, 15th of September, sorry, 14th of September 2015, gravitational wave. This patch here of the sky is the, the sort of estimate we have of where the signal came from, again, and these, these colours are telling us the different, prob the different certainties with which we, we're sure it came within this region. Okay, so it came somewhere in here, but we don't know exactly where. And that's the kind of information we send out to our colleagues with telescopes. And we did that. And this is, this, this is, again, the same patch of the sky. And these different coloured patches are parts of the sky in which our colleagues with telescopes were able to look. They tiled that sort of region trying to look and see if there was an optical counterpart on an X-ray counterpart. Now, it just so happens this kind of source, two black holes, might not have produced any signal. And in fact, I think there's, there's no strong evidence there was any other signal associated with that. Not surprising. But in future, this is going to be a very important thing to do. So where are we going in future? I'll try and explain this plot. But what's key is that from the observations that we've made, we can combine that with our knowledge of uh, astronomy, astrophysics, and try and predict in future, when we take more data, how many more signals we might be likely to see. So looking at these pairs of black holes, again, um, we've seen one again so far, and, and one other signal that was kind of above the background, but not big enough we could claim it as a detection. If we project forward, O1 is our jargon for our first observing run. And we're still analysing the data taken in that. We, we've only analysed some of it so far to get this, this event. 
we think as we go on into the next observing run that we'll be in a, in a region where we could potentially see several events. There's uncertainty, but here's 10 events again. So we're starting to get to the point where we, we're hopeful we're, we, we, we'll make more detections as we turn our detectors on again, because at the moment they're off, they're, we're improving them, we'll turn them back on again uh, probably in the late summer, early autumn this year, and that's going to be a very exciting time. So more of these pairs of black hole systems is clearly a target, but we'll also be searching for signals from some of those other sources I talked about, supernovae, binary black holes colliding, things perhaps we don't even know exist yet. Because there's a rich set of science questions that we want to try and answer with gravitational waves, and some of those we're starting to tackle already. But they cover fundamental physics um, and relativity, Again, what are the properties of gravitational waves? General relativity makes predictions, um, but we're starting to be able now to quantify those things. Gravity, well, is general relativity the correct theory of gravity? There are other theories of, of, of gravity, and gravity is, again, probably the least understood of, of all the four forces. General relativity, is it, does it still work under super strong gravity when we have massive, supermassive black holes colliding? We're in, in regions of, of hugely strong gravity conditions. Does general relativity still hold there when we're getting very close to, 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 to huge distortions in space? If we, we look at, if, if we can detect these strange neutron stars colliding, we have theories about what the material inside should look like but it's so dense and under conditions that we just can't replicate here on Earth because gravity is so strong. Measuring the gravitational signals actually should give us information potentially about what neutron stars are actually made of. Cosmology. We believe our universe is expanding. It's not only expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion. And nobody understands why. And again, it's a real mystery today in, in, in physics. What's going on? What's causing the, the accelerating expansion of the universe? Now, we have measurements of that using electromagnetic signals. Gravity, gravitational signals, is a completely different way to study these sorts of things. And again, as, a, as I'll say, we need to know that. Astronomy and astrophysics, where and how do these black holes actually form? How are they related to galaxy formation? I told you what we believe happens when a star collapses and, and, a, and a supernova again uh, uh, happens. We have models, but most of the information that we get, not all, but most, comes from the outside of such an event. The electromagnetic signals, the light, come from the outside, and we have to try and deduce what's happening inside. Gravity cannot be masked. The gravitational signals are coming from the core collapse. So again, we hope to get information that we can't really get any other way. There's a whole list, I won't go through them all, but we're just at the start now of, of again, some, some fascinating dis sort of discoveries. To do that, though, again, we want this network, and we hope that by about 2020, the construction of these other uh, Earth-based detectors should be uh, uh, complete. To show you what difference that makes, this is, again, one of those plots of the sky and what those blue ellipses, those blue blobs are, is an estimate of how well we could tell where a signal was coming from. In this case, if we had uh, uh, just the LIGO sites and a European detector, and you can see there are even some red Xs there, and we would not be sensitive to gravitational waves in that part of the sky at all. And again, these are these big sort of uncertain regions. Um, again, difficult to... To, to give to our astronomy colleagues and, and tell them to be able to, to, to use that as a, as a guide as to where to point their telescopes. By about 2020, with a detector in India and a detector in Japan, K there stands for CAGRA, that uncertainty shrinks. We can do much better, again, with that multiple detector network. So, again, at long last, the area of gravitational wave astronomy is now here. 
We expect soon to be making regular detections. But no one ever met an astronomer who really felt they had a big enough telescope and could really see all the things they wanted to see. So we are, we are no different. We have plans to how to make these detectors better. In fact, currently they're not even at their design sensitivity. That's, some, that's why we've turned off and we're improving. Um, but remember, there's that whole spectrum of other potential sources, exciting sources of gravitational waves we want to study. And I said that some of those we can't study with detectors here on the Earth. And so there are plans, in fact, to put a detector in space. This is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And the Andromeda galaxy, I think, in our galaxy, at some point in the future, again, may possibly collide. We know there are galaxy collisions out there. It's a beautiful picture. This is the MICE Nebula, which is two galaxies that we believe are in the process of colliding. And why do we believe that? Well, there are a lot of uh, folks out there who do galaxy collision simulations. And this is one such simulation. There's two galaxies. In the process of colliding, if we stop and compare that simulation to the MICE Nebula, you'll see it looks very similar. If we let it keep going, you'll see the galaxies don't just pass through one another. Their centers actually start to merge as the galaxies collide. Now, why do we think that's true? Well, if we run the simulation again and we strip the stars off from that simulation, in the centre of those galaxies, as there is at the centre of our own galaxy, we believe there's a supermassive black hole. And what's happening there is those two supermassive black holes have got caught and are spiralling around to eventually, we think, collide. Now, that's a source that we could not, we think, detect here on Earth. For that, which would be a fabulous thing to see, we would need to put a detector in space. And so, in fact, the European Space Agency has selected studies of the gravitational universe as a topic for one of its future large uh, mission concepts. And the idea there would be to fly a constellation of spacecraft. You can see in this picture here, this is one version in which there are three laser beams going between them, sensing the distance between the spacecraft again, to sense if a gravitational wave passes by and changes the relative separation of the spacecraft. Here you can see this is what's in called heliocentric orbit. It's a constellation following the Earth around the Sun. This time, the, the arms and the instrument wouldn't be a few kilometers. The, one of the concepts for this, I think, is 500 million kilometers. There's plenty of room out there in space. Um, different, different versions of this exist. But clearly, to fly some of this technology, um, it's important to demonstrate some of that technology if we're going to fly in space. And so actually, last year was a very big year for us. There was the launch of what's called the LISA Pathfinder demonstrator mission for some of the technology for a space-based gravitational wave detector, where we took those arms and shrunk them down to about 30 centimeters or so. Um, and put in one spacecraft, and again, the UK has, uh, this is a, again a pan uh, a country project, the UK is one of the partners, and again with colleagues in Birmingham, we built some of the technology at the heart of that. So here you can see our, our two, two, this is effectively our two mirrors here, there are two test particles with laser beams fired between them to try and uh, test out some of that technology. So. That, that mission actually, again, was launched in December, just at the end of last year, and that all went very well. It was launched uh, from French Guiana. This is, a, again, a quick snapshot. It went very fast. Again, it was off very, very quickly um, of, the, of the mission launch, which all went very well. And uh, it takes quite a while for the spacecraft to go up, to go out to a special point, which is called, which, which called the Lagrange point, a point between uh, uh, us uh, and, as we'll see, a distance out there. And it's a little clip to show you how that went. So again, the spacecraft was launched. It did some maneuvers, some slingshot maneuvers round the Earth, um, uh, and then went off out into space, round and round, there we go, getting up, getting up energy to go, went off and then went out, and this again took quite some time, 
And then it circles round the Lagrange point, a special balanced gravity point, where it then uh, has been sitting, actually, for quite some time now, um, with, the, with the scientists looking at the data coming back, checking how well it's performing. And what's in there, well, inside that spacecraft, we can see... You can see there's L1. This is the special balance point of gravity between us and the sun, which is where the spacecraft is heading. And if we zoom in, what's going to happen is those two test masses, this time they're not really mirrors, but test, test particles whose position we're monitoring, you can see about 30, 30 to 40 centimetres apart inside the spacecraft, so they f they're freely floating. You can see there, um, there, there are cages around them which don't touch them. The space, the, those, those, those cubes are freely floating. There's optical sensing between them. That's all carefully shielded in a, in a, in a spacecraft, again, which is protecting them as they, those cubes try and freely float. Remember, those are, those are our test particles. Again, because things like the solar wind, again, will try and buffet the spacecraft. It's got little thrusters, again, to push back and just float around these freely floating spacecraft. And that's what we have in the middle there. So that is actually has been working very well, I believe. Uh, we'll, we'll hear soon, I think, the results from that over, over the next month or so. Again, testing technology for a potential a full gravitational wave detector in space at some point in the future. Our advanced detector network's working here on the ground. LIGO's made those first detections. We, that's absolutely fabulous. The rest of the detectors to follow. And again, on the ground, we're looking to the future. How can we make those detectors more sensitive? And again, it's interesting. I said at the beginning, gravity was. Um, again, it's a, a, a very interesting force, personally for me, but in general for us all, to, to try and under a medium to understand the universe through. Because again, we believe of, of all the stuff there is in the universe, the ordinary atoms and molecules and stuff like you and I, how much of that we understand? Well, about 4 to 5% of the universe is made of ordinary matter. We know there's other stuff out there, stuff we call dark matter, because we can see something out there has extra gravitational effects. We do not know what dark matter is. We said the universe is expanding and accelerating in its expansion. We say that's because of something called dark energy causing, <laughs> causing the universe to accelerate. It's a name we give. We don't know what, what's happening, what's happening there. To help us understand, we need new physics, and new physics particularly for gravity. And we know that every time we've turned on a telescope in the electromagnetic spectrum, we've seen completely different things. The universe looks completely different with different telescopes. For the first time now, we're looking at it for the first time through its gravitational signals. And we've already made discoveries. We couldn't have made any other way with that, those binary black hole systems. So the question is now, over the next few years, what more discoveries will gravitational waves reveal? And I'll stop there. But what about finding gravity waves here on Earth? Is that possible anytime soon?